welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Well, if you've been following the Plant Paradox program for a while now, there's a good chance you've been spending more and more time in your kitchen. And of course, that's great. Because the truth is, it's nearly impossible to find healthy lectin-free meals, dining out, or ordering from your favorite restaurants. So even the thought of healthy options such as salads, soups, or veggie dishes usually contain hidden dangerous ingredients like omega-6 oils or lectin bomb ingredients. And while you might occasionally come come across a truly lectin-free option, cooking at home is your best tool for finding success with my program. And my guest today knows just what I'm talking about. In a moment, I'll speak with Jesse, AKA the sensitive vegan, after struggling with some pretty, pretty serious health issues, Jesse's been able to successfully turn his health around for the most part by following my Plant Paradox program. He now has his very own lectin-free cooking channel on YouTube, which is how I discovered him, where he shares his creative recipes in a step-by-step, easy-to-follow, and may I say, often very humorous manner. On today's episode, Jesse will share his impressive journey to health, tips for vegans on the Plant Paradox program, and professional cooking advice to help you cook your way to better health. Jesse, it's great to have you on the show, you sensitive vegan you. Thank you, it's good to meet you. Nice to have you here. So can you, why don't we start, give us, give everybody listening a little bit of your health background and health journey. What what was going on in your life? So I, you know, I I considered myself a lactose ovo vegetarian for the longest time since, I guess since 2010, I don't know how long that is, but uh, I made the conversion to vegan, veganism, and I was really into the weightlifting and working out all the time. And I just found after a while uh, on the diet that I was on, um, I started experiencing body pain. First, it was like my, my right shoulder, and I thought, oh yeah, I overdid it at the gym, lifting too much weights, trying to show off. And within a couple of weeks, the left shoulder got sore, and then it, it moved to my right knee and then my left knee. And I obviously had no idea what was going on. And I, I saw all the doctors and specialists. I, you know, I checked with naturopaths, Chinese medicine, and I just had no assistance whatsoever for, I guess, looking at about three years. And um, yeah, I ended up losing, I probably lost over 40 pounds. Uh, I became pretty immobile. And I just didn't have any answers. That's not so, good. Well, so, <laughs> yeah. It, so it, when you were, when you were, and, and you know, this is a very common experience. When you were seeing all the specialists, the naturopaths, I mean, what, what were they telling you? What was the diagnosis? Did they want you to go on immunosuppressive meds? Blah, blah, blah. It's so, it was so frustrating. Um, it was something different with each one. Obviously now I know how uh, sensitive I am to these different compounds, uh, corn, corn and cornstarch being one of them. So I'd go see the naturopath and they go, oh, you know, you've got some, you've got some, uh, uh, some flare ups around your body. We don't, we're not sure what's gonna really cause it, but let's get you on uh, some turmeric or, or whatever it is that they use to, to sort of quell that sensitivity and it's in a capsule made of cornstarch. So I'm popping these every day and not getting better. And then uh, with the doctors, they wanted to rule out uh, bone cancer. So I got all these expensive tests done and all the time between visits, talk about maybe six months, Canadian uh, medical system waiting between visits and just really uh, wasted time as far as I was concerned because I was in pain this whole time and I was complaining about what I was experiencing, it felt like uh, it felt like injuries all over my body, and I was just you know seeking help and yeah, every all the testing that I was getting, all the elaborate sort of stuff that they were doing wasn't really helping. Now you've referred to yourself as a recovering soy boy. I, I love that. Uh, <laughs> what what was your diet like back then? Okay, so I. 
it was awesome. I loved my diet back then. I would get up in the morning before I go to work. I'd make myself a six shot espresso. Uh, just kind of put that on the side and I get some breakfast tacos, tacos going. They'd have chipotle, uh, homemade habanero salsa, just kind of just a, a mix of just non pressure cooked beans and the hottest peppers I could get with a lot of vegetable fats too. And, it was awesome. I mean, I, I probably had bref- breakfast tacos for breakfast, lunch. Then I'd come home and make a stir fry, uh, you know, white rice stir fry sort of thing. And um, yeah, it, it it tasted really good. It was fun to eat that much. Uh, I was also the kind of person I would eat all through the night before, <laughs> before I uh, ended up listening to you or reading your books. I'd have a banana next to the bed and I would eat 24 hours. As far as I was concerned, I'd wake up every couple hours and eat again, um, trying to put on the pounds. And uh, yeah, it wasn't good for my stomach, for starters. So while I had all these flare-ups around my body and, and sore everything, I also had a really, a lot of stomach aches and a lot of, uh, yeah, soreness down there. So, all right, so you're eating 24 hours a day. Uh, you heard all over the Canadian healthcare system uh, has been failing you and you're going six months between appointments and not getting anywhere. So um, how, how did you come across the plant paradox? Well, a really nice guy in a health food store told me about uh, plant paradox. Have you read the plant paradox? And I was immediately dismissed it because I'd heard so many things that I was like, oh, that's a diet thing. No, no, no. I'm vegan. I have the perfect diet. Uh, you, you can't fix my diet. Uh, so it's definitely not that. It's something else. Um, I was pretty desperate at that point. So in any event, I picked up the book. And within, I think I even, uh, it was on Audible, and I just forwarded to the diet part because uh, I really wanted to know what I had to change. Within a week, the pain was gone. And I could feel that my body was actually healing. So I was sold right there. Aha. All right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it, you, you bring up an interesting uh, story uh, that I talk about in, in one of my books. Um, Deepak Chopra's representative for Japan um, is a young woman who had a severe rheumatoid arthritis, had two hip replacements in her 20s, had a knee replacement, and was basically bedridden. And a friend from Canada uh, said, you know, I want to send you the plant paradox. And, you know, try it. You know, it's because whatever, you know, she was l- literally doing an Ayurvedic brown rice, you know, soy diet. And literally within weeks, her pain went away and she actually uh, a few years ago uh, flew to palm springs to meet me and thank me walked in uh, her rheumatoid arthritis is gone and yeah so you're telling me uh, thank you for saying that story because you know it's it's hard to believe but it does happen yeah it's tricky because of course i saw a rheumatologist and then you get tested for these things and they're like no there's there's no there's no arthritis. Uh, there is some inflammation, but yeah. So frustrating until you actually get on the diet. So what did you did you go cold turkey? Did you dive right in? I mean, obviously I have vegan options for you know every one of my recipes. Uh, or did you just gradually do it, or what'd you do? So I jumped right in because I was inadvertently already doing one of your, I guess, the five-day vegan cleanse that that was extending about a month. I was just doing broth, and uh, I had legumes in there. Uh, That was was the the bad part. But um, since I was kind of already doing – I was already vegan – so, yeah, it, it wasn't tough to just introduce these things that like sweet potatoes and yucca and stuff like that that I knew were okay according to your theory. And, yeah, it, it worked right away, so I dove right in. So, okay, so, you know, so you've done kind of in the way the hard part. Uh, you were a vegan already. Um, yeah. 
let's, let's, let's talk about your experience being a vegan on this program. So let's back up. You were a lacto-ovo vegetarian. Why did you make the jump to vegan? I'm not sure whether it was influences like maybe dating vegan girls. I, I don't know what it, whether it was a one too many documentaries that I watched, like, like I think it is for a lot of people. And it's just like, okay, I can do this. I know I can do this. I, 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 probably the first one was more, more important. You were dating a vegan girl or something like that. Yeah, I think that rubs off on a few people. <laughs> so, but this, so this wasn't, I mean, you want to save the planet or not, you know, not destroy animals, but it just seemed like a, a good idea. All of the above. Once you, you're kind of interested, like, you know, I've heard this is good for health, and then you hear some of the arguments and you see some of the some of the nasty stuff that happens with the factory farming and you're like, you know, I don't want to support this. So I think it's a positive thing. Okay. So what was the, what was the biggest struggle about being a vegan on the plant paradox program or what is continuing to be the biggest struggle? Yeah, absolutely. The, the two hardest things is vegan food. So all the, all the pre-packaged vegan food products that you have in the grocery store that look so good uh, and taste so good are so not good for you because it's all the same, I don't know, three ingredients. And it's, they all, it's the same thing once it gets in you. It's just going to cause the inflammation and it's just not healthy. You have that plus the vegan restaurants that you want to go to and there's absolutely nothing you can order there. Uh, so the, you just have to go for the salad at a restaurant, maybe you can go, okay, can I have the fries today? It's been like a month since I've had nightshades, so I think I'm going to try the fries, and then I'll taking a gamble with the ketchup. And uh, yeah, so the trickiest part of being a vegan is just the vegan food is not compatible with the diet, which is why I, I came up with my own recipes. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a, um, a friend uh, in, the, in the Palm Springs area who it has some it has some vegan restaurants and she's wonderful and I adore her and there's probably only two things in it that I can eat in her restaurants and she actually asked me to do a forward for her cookbook and I, you know I you know I go well I adore you and you know good for you but you know I can't even eat in your in your restaurant <laughs> yeah um, so yeah, so this is, you know, it's very frustrating. And as I've said on my podcast and I've written about, I take care of a, a, a large number of vegan and vegetarians because of my experience at, at Loma Linda, which is, you know, a vegetarian and vegan Adventist health system. And quite frankly, some of the vegans, when I first meet them, are some of my sickest people. They they are rampant with autoimmune diseases. And, you know, when I, like your experience, when I take away uh, so many of their, you know, almost sacred foods, it's when they start getting better. Um, it's funny you talk about sacred foods because I, so when I started uh, publishing my recipes, I started a column in the the local newspaper and I was writing about the diet and I was publishing a new recipe every week, I think. And some of the biggest critics I had were vegans and it's vegan food that I'm producing here. Uh, some of them even suggesting that, you know, the diet was dangerous and I should have warnings. And I'm like, I don't need warnings for healthy food. So it's just funny because they do, Vegans seem to have these sacred foods or sacred food products where you tell them it's not exactly as healthy as they thought, and they became quite angry about it. Um, but, you know, with, with you, I find the two biggest arguments for veganism with plant paradox is the IGF-1 levels that you can control by limiting or just outright getting rid of meat products, and also just the inadvertent grains that you're going to you're going to ingest if you eat animal products and getting rid of those things is a huge health benefit. So uh, it's funny that vegans tend to be so, um, so critical of the plant paradox diet to begin with. 
Yeah, I mean, we, I, I certainly have my, my vegan critics, um, but, uh, you know, recently um, we had actually one of my formerly biggest critics on our podcast, Joel Furman, who I'm actually a big fan of, and uh, got him to admit that he pressure cooks his beans. <laughs> and I went, well, you know, why aren't you telling people about that? Because, you know, I, I last week I had beans uh, twice and they were pressure cooked. And, you know, I'm, yes. not, I'm not anti-legumes. You just got to <laughs> treat them with respect. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, and it, so it is kind of funny people saying, you know, I'm, I'm anti-bean. Well, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm... I'm anti the bean trying to kill me, and as long as I can, you know, de defuse it, it's a, it's a it's a great potential part of the diet. Although I do uh, I do have a few people that even pressure cooked beans uh, gets them. They they can absolutely tell. Um, but I, you brought up a very interesting point, and I, I don't want to take away from your time, but your point is very well taken. I think we miss, and vegans maybe, maybe know this, so when we feed animals corn and soybeans or other grains, uh, you are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. And uh, years ago when I first started doing this, I, I really didn't want to believe that until I had some people with autoimmune diseases where the final straw that solved their autoimmune problem was getting rid of organic chicken in their diet. And they didn't realize that organic chickens were fed organic corn and soybeans. And when we took those healthy organic chickens away from them, that's when things resolved. And recently, we had uh, one of my followers, because of a nutritionist telling her that she really needed to get more animal protein in her diet, she contacted a farmer and started eating what they thought was grass-fed beef and pastured chicken. And the more she added this to her diet, the more pain, just like yourself, she began experiencing more joint pain, more headaches. And she got so desperate, she finally contacted me and said, I don't get it, I'm doing everything right. And I said, so what's your farmer feeding his animals? And she said, well, uh, they're grass fed. And I said, are you sure? So she called him up. She, he said, well, you know, we have to supplement their diet. And she said, well, what are you supplementing with? Well, you know, corn and soybeans and grains. And, and she <laughs> said, but wait a minute. You know, you said that they were grass-fed. He said, oh, you know, that, we have to give them stuff. So I said, well, there you go. That. Yeah, and she, in five days, 70% of her pain was gone when she stopped eating that, that healthy food. So your point is very well taken. And to be honest, I tried the, the egg thing myself. Um, you know, you get pretty desperate, even on the vegan diet, you get desperate, you want to try something else when things just aren't working for you. And I tried the egg thing and yeah, within um, 30 days of it, I had this swollen left knee for no reason. And I just, I, it's the egg. So I just cut it out and of course, you know, they're, they're supplementing the diet with these things. All right. So uh, how, did you, how did you come up with your YouTube channel? How did you get so funny? Are you a natural comedian? Are you a performer? Well, thanks for, thanks for saying that. Uh, so I think what I do is I, I want to bring value to people. I want to bring... Uh, these, these recipes, but I want it to be fun. So number one, I'm always going to put the joke ahead of the, uh, ahead of even the, the product. So it's going to be goofy all the time. It's I'm going to be an idiot. I'm going to say stupid stuff. I'm going to be arguing with my wife 
And that's all going in the videos. Number one, it has to be entertaining because there's too many cooking shows out there where you're just watching the person, maybe the overhead of the stirring the thing in there. And it's just so boring. There's so much of it out there. So I want to do something that's very different. And uh, I'm glad that you agree that I'm funny. I hope your viewers will think so when you check out my videos. And uh, yeah, I just the, the point is that I want to bring value to people that are going through or have gone through the same thing that I did. And, you know, it's so difficult when you start to limit what you can actually eat. And if you're passionate about food like I am, I want to, I don't want to not have pizza. I want to have lasagna. I want to have spring rolls. I, you know, I want flatbread. And uh, I, so, and I want cheese and I want it to melt. The cheese has to be vegan and it has to melt. And uh, I just want to experience all those things just like everyone else. So, um, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from with my YouTube. All right. So how do you get melting vegan, vegan cheese? Come on, help, help us out here. I mean, do we have to go to your YouTube video right now or can you, can you give us a tip? Well, I think it's only fair that you go to my YouTube, maybe just watch this first, but you know, it's only a few <laughs> ingredients. Uh, it's my main cheese that I use is a coconut mozzarella and it does melt. Uh, I, I have a few thickening agents that I use, arrowroot powder, tapioca, agar, and these are things that most people aren't familiar with. Mostly people are going to go to cornstarch or what they're used to or flour, and there's so many other options out there that are so much better for your health. Do you have any, do you have any go-to foods? Um, years ago when I started studying people's food habits, people in general uh actually have five main dishes or main meals that they just repeat over and over and over again and so you got any go-to things that you know you just repeat all all the time yeah that's that's really true uh i'd have to say that uh cassava flour flatbread is my go-to even when I'm not planning that that's going to be breakfast or lunch it just is and when you have some sort of spread uh, I can show you if you check out my uh, YouTube I can show you a uh, uh, Brazil nut uh, sour cream a vegan sour cream with Brazil nuts that you can spread on there or maybe just do the olive oil and uh, balsamic vinegar and it's so good and it's so easy that I, I eat it every day Wow Oh, you're making me hungry. We're, we're going to pause here. We're going to we'll be right back. I'm, I'm going to go to his YouTube channel. I'm going to find out how to make it. Oh, okay. Well, we're back. No. <laughs> oh, here we are. We're, we're just joking. All right. Everybody talks about B12 and vegans. What say you? Okay. So I supplement that stuff uh, with Plant Paradox. Uh, if you are as sensitive as I am, uh, what you want to do is get the capsule and open it up into some cranberry juice. And yeah, don't just take the contents, not the capsule. And I supplement it. It's that simple. I think there's a little bit in mushrooms. And yeah. uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I, you know, some of your past guests, including you, talk about having a biodiversity in your gut. Um, with the microbiome and I every now and again I'll do the shellfish thing I'll do the uh, halibut thing uh, just to make sure that I'm healthy in my stomach I don't want to be running into IBS because there's only one type of bacteria in there or it's just not working for me so uh, yes I do I do cheat on veganism uh, every now and again and I'm totally comfortable set. Aha okay uh, that was going to be my next question. Um, we measure what's called the omega-3 index uh, in our patients, which basically looks at two months uh, of fish oil in, in your system. And there are, of course, now plenty of vegan sources for DHA. And the vast majority of vegans that I see early on are very, very deficient in DHA and EPA. And they used to drink flaxseed oil like, you know, I don't know, champagne. 
and they still have no <laughs> DHA and EPA because they just don't convert it into long chain fatty acids. Um, where do you get your, do you take a vegan DHA or where do you get your long chain fat, omega-3 fats? I, I'm not that skilled in this one. Um, let's see, avocados, olive oil, MCT oil, nuts. Um, am I hitting anything there? No, there's no omega-3 fats in that. Wow. Um, I don't know. It just works out for me. Maybe is it the piece of halibut that I eat every yeah, couple it's weeks? Probably, yeah, it's the piece of halibut you, that you eat. Uh, okay. Shellfish are actually very rich in, in those things. So, and Yeah, you yeah I do the scallop connect. thing. Yeah, you could have Prince, you know, Prince Edward Island mussels uh, from time to time. From time to time, I could. From time to time. All right. Um, so let's get to your YouTube channel. Um, we, what was your inspiration for even starting it? Uh, like I say, you're, you're great at it, and I hope when people leave this podcast, they, they, you know, they jump to your YouTube channel and get as entertained as I am watching it. So what, what started it? Well, I, I wanted a side project. I uh, just wanted something extra to work on. And to be honest, what word can I use? Uh, I was depressed and disappointed, angry that everybody else got to eat good food and I didn't. So I wanted to, I wanted to experiment. My background, I, I worked as a chef. I came up with features for the menu. It's something that I, you know, I did regularly and I kind of missed that about it. So being able to share those ideas and come up with stuff and, and really, I, I want people to be jealous of the vegan plant paradox rather than me being jealous of, oh, you get to eat pizza. You know, you maybe you walk by at work and somebody's got a pizza or a pizza pop or something like that in the microwave. It smells so good. I want that. Or you walk by, or you walk by uh, uh, McDonald's or something and they've got the exhaust fan. You can smell the French fries. I just wanted to, yeah, I want to experience something just as good or not better than everyone else. So I think that's, that's where it comes from. And just the ability to, you know, when I started, I didn't know how it would go. I didn't even know how I'd be on camera. Um, but when I started to hear from people who thank you for, you know, for creating this, for sharing this, I've cooked it for my family. My kids are, they can't eat anything. And hearing that from the community was amazing to me. So being able to make a difference and actually provide that value is, is I think where it comes from. Uh, you know, you, you call yourself the sensitive vegan, and I, I just thought you were, you know, a, a sensitive individual. But, you know, food sensitivities um, are, are very, very real. Uh, they are not in people's heads, I can assure our listeners that. And you just mentioned that a lot of people, you know, watch your videos and then write you and say, you know, thanks for doing this because my kid can't eat anything. Um, are you finding there's this vast community out there that's underserved, or maybe the better word is not believed in terms of their sensitivities to foods? Not believed, I would say. And it's so tricky because people will get put on, I think, the wrong path. And it's like, so I'm, I'm just going through your, your new book, The Energy Paradox, and you break down some of the myths about what people think they're dealing with. And I think it's adrenal fatigue. I think it's this. And they'll go to the doctor with that. And they're now in their head, they're part of the adrenal fatigue group. So you're only going to, if, if you're that, you're only going to reach out for resources that, that are that. Um, coming to kind of learn more about this, it's, it's more, I think it's more for everyone. I think it's the lectin thing. I, I really do. So uh, people are going to come from different sort of schools of thought for what they're looking for. And it's difficult to reach everyone because they all have a different idea of what they think is wrong. And there's so few re resources out there. So, um, 
So that's, I think, what's difficult. Uh, if you, I mean, <laughs> I do not have the biggest YouTube following. I don't have the biggest Instagram following, if you look. And it's really difficult to try to connect with these people because I don't think they even know what the problem is. Well, we're going to try to change that. Um, like I say, um, you know, good for you. You are entertaining. Uh, well, I, so I didn't actually realize that you were uh, a chef. And so how, you know, how do you, what's your creative process? And, you know, you make uh, coconut bacon, you know, okay. How the heck do you make bacon out of coconut? Because, you know, everybody has to have bacon. I mean, come on, be, be honest. So it's with that one, I can't take credit. A vegan chef knows that that one is it's in the community. It's swirling around there. There's a few variations of it. It's something I had to share on the channel because uh, I want to be the vegan chef that is for everyone. I'm the people's vegan, basically. <laughs> and I don't, want, I don't want people to feel like, oh, it's one of those vegan channels. Some of those vegans be very judgmental. Uh, I don't really like that attitude. I don't want to be judged or feel critical. Um, so they kind of shy away from the vegan cooking channels. And I just want to be the one that can reach everyone. There's no judgment here and my food's for everyone. Uh, as far as my creative process, I don't know. I'm a chef. I pay attention to when I eat something or when I see something new. I wonder how they make that. I spend the whole day in the kitchen. I just, uh, you know, <laughs> leave to eat or lay down, have a nap, and I'm back in the kitchen. So I'm always dealing with this stuff. Well, good for you. Um, one of my sayings is I want you to eat food you love, but food that loves you back. And it, it sounds like that's really your mantra. Um, because I've found that if, you know, if people like what they're eating, uh, they're more, more likely to stick with this. And, and certainly my, my experience uh, as a professor at Loma Linda for many, many years um, the Adventists were, were experts at making uh, mystery meats that, uh, out, of, out of plants that actually acted as if you were eating, you know, animal-based meats. And in fact, one of, one of my funniest stories, uh, my, my late partner, Leonard Bailey, who was chairman of the Department of Surgery, we had a Christmas party every year at a local hotel, and it was, in general, all uh, vegetarian food. And you know, the, the hospital was very good at making fake shrimp um, out of, uh, yeah, fake shrimp. And so we were at this party, and he comes back from the buffet table, and he's got this big pile of, of shrimp. And he turns to his wife, he says, Gosh, he says, you know, the chefs are getting better and better at this. These are the best fake shrimp I've ever had. And she looked at him and says, you idiot, those are real shrimp. <laughs> he said, oh, well, no wonder. <laughs> so, yeah, it, but, but it's, it, it's fun. People, you know, really do want these foods, these flavors that they miss. And, uh, you know, I was, I was a raw vegan for about nine months and actually had superb health, although it was completely impractical, completely impractical. But one of the <laughs> arguments that I learned was we're really after uh, flavors and seasonings. And it's these flavors and seasonings, th these flavors that we're looking for. And not, and you know, the, the piece of chicken was just these spices that it was cooked in that was really what you were after. And talk to that. I think you would, you as a well, chef would say absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, like I'm interested in replicating what the non-vegan, the non-plant paradox product. So if you, if you check out my food, it's a lot. I mean, there's ravioli in there. There's there's lasagna. There's spring rolls, um, and I I just try to replicate. Like, for instance, with the spices, um, 
how does how does cheese taste like cheese? Like how does mozzarella taste like mozzarella? So a little spoiler, there's some in my product, there's a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of coconut vinegar, just that tang mixed with a little salt. Oh, it tastes like mozzarella. And it's it's that easy to kind of replicate these flavors. So why am I putting the bad for me product in me just because someone's marketing it to me when there's the sensitive vegan who can show me how to make it from scratch in my house for, uh, you know, in a short amount of time. What, uh, what do you find uh, in general, what was the hardest thing for you to give up? And what do you, what do your listeners say are the hardest things for them to give up? Well, that's a very sad, Dr. Gundry. Um, the saddest thing, oh, sorry there. The saddest thing that I've given up is coffee. And uh, every time I smell it, I'm jealous. Uh, I'll actually sniff my wife's coffee. She lets me. Um, so what happens is I build up a strong uh, microbiome. The mucus in there is really healthy with all the probiotics. And then I'm, okay, I'm good now. I feel I feel like I don't really have to be on Plant Paradox right now. And I'll go ahead, make myself a coffee. I won't pressure cook it. I'll just make myself an espresso. And it's totally fine. I feel totally fine. I feel great because there's caffeine in me. And then the next day, I'm, okay, everything's fine. I'm just going to have another coffee. And then it doesn't go so well. And then <laughs> I'm in pain and I have stomach pain and I have to call in sick for work. And, uh, yeah, that definitely coffee is the hardest thing to give up especially when you smell it. Interesting. Well, we, we do have a few people that uh, definitely test positive, you know, for coffee as a food sensitivity. We, we have a few people that cacao, um, they, they, they test positive as a food sensitivity. Uh, let me ask you, do you, are you sensitive to black pepper? I'm not at the moment, but I think I was. Huh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, you got any coffee replacements that you like? No, I've tried, like, I've tried them all. I tried the dandelion coffee, which is really good, uh, but it's got some grains in it. Um, no, I just haven't had luck with a good coffee replacement. And actually, all caffeine is giving me some sort of issues. So, I can't even do the matcha tea anymore. Interesting. It's really right. sad. Yeah. All right. Uh, give me three staples that your listeners, my listeners, should always keep in their kitchen. Okay. So you got to have the cassava flour uh, to make the flatbread and also to bread deep fried vegetables when you want. So you got the, the cassava flour, olive oil, and a nut that you like whether it's almonds, Brazil nuts, macadamias. With that, you can make the flatbread, the nut spreads. Uh, you can use the nuts and the olive oil in your shake. And there's so many things you can do with the cassava flour. So those are my top three. Uh, do you have a pressure cooker? I do have a pressure cooker. And I only pressure cook beans at the moment. Uh, and it's the only way that I can eat beans. So thank you for that tip because I do love them, especially lima beans. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I have, I have a number of patients uh, who are originally from Brazil uh, or India, and so many of them uh, tell me that, you know, pr pressure cooking beans is as old a tradition as pressure cookers existed and that their mothers and their grandmothers had always taught them, you have to pressure cook beans. Um, and in fact, how I, did we lose this? Well, because, you know, and I talk about this, we've lost, uh, we've lost, actually, chefs know this, we've lost the oral tradition of grandparents teaching parents, parents teaching their children of, you know, here's what we do. Uh, last year, pre-COVID, I was at a biodynamic winery in Tuscany, and they have a biodynamic garden, and they had huge numbers of gorgeous Roma tomatoes. 
and I was walking with the winemaker, and I said, so, oh, you, you know, you grow tomatoes. You know, what do you use it for? He says, oh, we make tomato sauce. I said, well, how do you make tomato sauce? And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you just throw the tomatoes in a pot. He said, oh, my gosh, we would never do that. We peel and de-seed the tomatoes. You can't make sauce with the peels and seeds. They're dangerous. I said, really? I said, where did you learn that? He says, what do you mean, where did I learn that? My mother taught me that. Where did your mother learn that? My, my grandmother taught her that. And we've lost all these traditions. Yeah, I mean, you just go to the supermarket and there's your tomato sauce. That's what you get, whatever's on the shelf. Nobody really talks about it. Yeah, it's like I remind anyone who will listen, the Incas ate a lot of quinoa, but they fermented their quinoa. They let it rot before they cook it. And it's not yeah. on the package directions. <laughs> Please ferment it blows my mind that they came up with this. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, here's this, here's this food that these people lived on and not investigate, well, what did they do to that food that they were able to, you know, make use of it? So, oh, well. Yeah. And it's sad because the most of this stuff is plant-based products that vegans flock to and then they think they're on their healthy vegan diet and it doesn't work out for one reason or another. And a lot of it is just these food products that they're eating and the way they're eating them. No, that's very true. Uh, okay, what about dessert? Uh, you got any trick for satisfying sweet tooth? Okay, so with Plant Paradox, tell me if this is, you know, you, you dissuade people from eating sugar. And I, two things that happened is now I don't crave sugar at all after being on the diet and I don't like, I don't crave eating at night either or early in the morning. So I don't personally have a sweet tooth, but my wife does. And I have, you can see on my Instagram, very down there is a, a pudding. That's like three layers. You got your strawberry vanilla chocolate pudding custard. And uh, I have that one as a go-to. And I'm sure I'll do a video showing people how to make it, but I don't tend to, I, I more crave the savory food. That's what I don't want to miss out on. All right. Uh, let me ask you, have you tried basil seeds yet? Oh, I didn't. That, I've been meaning to. I heard about it on your podcast. I, I, want, I want you to give them a try. <laughs> uh, if you've okay. got the Energy Paradox book, uh, there's some basil seeds in there for you. All right. Uh, so, Sensitive Vegan. What a great name. Uh, it's, it's been great having you on the show. But before I let you go, uh, I understand that you actually have some questions for me. So, instead of doing the audience question today, uh, let's have at it, okay? I do have some questions. Okay, so, yeah, you were mentioning in the longevity paradox that 15 years ago you would have dismissed leaky gut theory as fanciful thinking. What is it with doctors that they want to dismiss a theory faster than anyone else? It's hard to explain plant paradox or have them, anyone believe it, but doctors don't want to believe this stuff at all. Can you tell me from your experience what it is about doctors that they're impossible to dissuade with new information? Well, of course, you know, in our training, we're literally kind of told that we are the authoritarian figure and that, you know, you, you have to project that authority for the patient to, to trust in you. But um, a number of years ago, um, there was a wonderful organization out of Boston called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And um, it was set up by a physician, a pediatrician, uh, that his research showed that the practicing physician is 20 years behind the current research knowledge in what he practices in his office. And so, um, a bunch of us in various fields were invited to actually look in our respective fields and 
literally even in universities, look at where the level of practice was, where the rubber met the road, versus you know, cutting edge knowledge. And it turns out that in all fields, it was about 20 years behind uh, the times. And uh, I personally saw that. I, was, uh, I trained a lot of Japanese surgeons uh, through my career, young surgeons, and I was invited to Japan to operate many times. And they had a hierarchy of the, the super senior surgeon. And believe it or not, he'd stand on, on three steps uh, to operate. And as the, as the more senior surgeon arrived, the table went up and the steps went up. And there was a saying that, that, that things didn't advance until the senior surgeon either died or retired. And then the next guy took his place and his, his level of training was about 10 years more advanced. And so it slowly would advance as the older guys would die off. And so there's a lot of that that I still see. So many times um, doctors, they don't see because their eyes aren't open. And uh, I've written about that. I see it all the time. And, you know, one of the great things that happened to me with Big Ed is luckily I had my eyes open when, you know, I could, I looked and saw that Big Ed had cleaned out his coronary arteries with a diet and supplements. And I go, how'd he do that? You know, and I spent my last 20 plus years figuring out how Big Ed did that and asking patients to teach me how they do that. So this is still very, very ingrained in our medical culture. The good news is that in functional medicine or restorative medicine, we're, we're beginning to see healthcare practitioners who are willing to look a little bit deeper and not just parrot party lines. And luckily, we now know there's great science, particularly from Dr. Fasano, who's now at Harvard, that leaky gut is not only real, but we know how it happens. And the good news is we know pretty much how to, how to fix it. Um, so it's, it's going to be a very long process. Uh, okay, so question number two. As I follow the plant paradox diet, my personal concern is that for some reason there's foods uh, not on the, uh, the no list that still trigger my autoimmune response. Um, personally, I've got like the caffeine thing is, is something, and then uh, bulbs like uh, garlic and onions. I'm just wondering um, what your experience is with, with people who have that and what might cause it. Yeah, so um, in recent years, particularly some of my troublemakers, uh, about 90% of people with autoimmune disease uh, go into remission on the plant paradox, just straight out of the book, the yes and no foods. But about 10% of my patients, despite being perfect, swearing that they never cheat, still have markers of autoimmune or leaky gut, and we can measure these markers. In those people, starting a few years ago, uh, we did a much more bigger in-depth look at food sensitivities, not food allergies, that's a totally different subject, but food sensitivities. And many times, a lot of these foods that uh, most people can tolerate were triggers. And garlic and onions, for instance, often come up. Uh, sweet potatoes and cassava certain people react to. And the good news is, I think the more you get the major triggers out of your diet, then you can actually become a very finely tuned consumer. And then you go, okay, uh, you know, now I notice that, for instance, caffeine is a trigger for me. I would have never noticed it because there were so many other things in, in the mix. But now, you know, oh, you know, now when I introduce this, there it is. So I think the benefit for most people is you become, for like it, like it or not, exquisitely sensitive to certain things. Now, 
personally, try pressure cooking your garlic and onions and you know, get back to me. That usually diffuses them for the most part. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, I'll definitely do that. Okay. Um, okay, so um, by the way, I, I enjoy your podcast and I like the sort of variety of guests that you have on. Um, with some of the different treatments that are out there, we have energy tapping, Chinese medicine, cold therapy like the Iceman. Um, I'm just wondering, do we know that uh, that autoimmune always starts in your stomach? Um, I know there's external factors talked about like stress and, and trauma. And I'm just wondering, I don't know if that's connected to, does it mean that there's other ways to treat it other than, than with your diet? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly lots of triggers. Most of these triggers actually trigger leaky gut. There's more and more evidence that viral infections may be one of the real underlying triggers of the start of leaky gut. COVID has certainly brought that out. COVID actually is a really good cause of leaky gut. And I'm convinced, and others are beginning to get convinced, that the long haul syndrome of COVID is persistent leaky gut that started with COVID causing leaky gut. And we'll, we'll, we'll see. Certainly a lot of my autoimmune patients can point to a cold or the flu that, or a GI, food poisoning was the start of their autoimmune disease. Um, certainly my experience has been that once we seal leaky gut and we can measure it, once we seal it, the vast majority, over 95% of autoimmune diseases uh, subside, go away. Now, can you flare it quickly? Yes, I've, I've done that on myself, uh, and I've written about that. Um, you, you always have to have your guard up, let's put it that way. Um, are you, yeah, uh, now, interesting, the Iceman and Chinese medicine, tapping. Uh, my next book is, uh, which I'm just finishing up, goes into how all these various modalities may play through a common factor. Uh, but if I told you what it is now, I'd have to kill you. Okay, fair enough. Sorry. I won't take that one. But that's a teaser for the next book, folks. All right. Well, Jesse, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll say your name one more time, but I know you're the sensitive vegan. All right. How do they find you? Where's the cooking channel? What, what name do they use? I bet you it's sensitive vegan. Yeah, just don't forget to put the capital the on there. So uh, the sensitive vegan on YouTube, please and thank you. Please, uh, please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. I want to hear from you. Uh, check out my Instagram too. Uh, there's at least links to the recipes in there if they aren't in them th themselves, and a lot of cool photos. So check out the sensitive vegan on YouTube and Instagram for a start. Uh, Facebook also, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, what's next for you? Any exciting projects? That's tricky. Well, I've got my backyard garden project going at the moment. And if you check out the channel, it's a lot of chainsaws. It's a lot of building a garden. Uh, I have a plant paradox garden that I'm, that I'm currently growing. It's coming along nicely. And I've learned that I really like chainsaws. So I'm, uh, I've been using them frequently. And the next video is going to be a serious chainsaw video and a very dangerous video, actually. I, I can see a whole new YouTube channel, The Chainsaw Vegan. And, and if you use oh. that, I want full credit, okay? Oh. <laughs> All right. We'll see, right. we'll see. Sensitive Vegan, so great to have you. Please, folks, check out his YouTube videos and Instagram. Believe me, you need to be entertained, particularly with what we've been through the last year and a half. And the guy's great, I mean it, and you know I don't uh, give praise lightly, so get to his YouTube channel and you'll thoroughly enjoy it. All right, thanks very much, good luck.
Thanks, Dr. Gundry. And keep entertaining us, okay? You got it. All right. Now it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from Melissa Arnotovic. Sorry, I probably fractured it on YouTube, who says, everything that Dr. Gundry recommends in terms of nutrition and foods to eat has benefited my life and has the opportunity to benefit yours. I was already a healthy eater, yet Dr. Gundry's teachings expanded my awareness further. I have been following the plant paradox for a year, and every day I wake up full of energy and my physical and intellectual health are soaring. Also, the food tastes great. Your taste buds will change as you adjust, so if you're just starting out, keep it up. It's worth it. Thank you, Dr. Gundry, for everything you do, and I will continue to support your messages and share them. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. You know, that's kind of been the subject of this actually entire podcast. You will notice changes, and initially you may have to work at it a little bit. But literally, sometimes within days you notice changes, sometimes it may take weeks. But the longer you keep at this, this is, this is not a diet. This is a lifestyle. And Melissa, it's notes from you that keep me doing this. And please, if you're, if you're listening and you like what you hear and you're watching, Give us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your reviews because we're going to get this message out to the world with your help. So thank you again because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you. Mm-hmm.